I am Katie Bloom. I am the political director of Conservation Voters of Pennsylvania. Um, and we really love working with all of these partners and we want to thank them. So thank you to Clean Water Action, to the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia, Penn Environment, the Audubon Mid-Atlantic, Penn Future, and the TTF Watershed. So again, thank you very, very much to Clean Water Action, SBN, Penn Environment, Audubon, Penn Future, and the TTF Watershed. Another reminder, um, please feel free to introduce yourself where you're at in the chat. It's always nice to say hello to your neighbors. And please feel free to rename yourself if need be. And if you do not want to be recorded, um, you can always uh, stop the video on your Zoom screen. So let's see, we've got a couple more moments here. Just a couple more people coming in. Looks like it's slowing down. So let's see. All right. Well, I think we will get started. So I do want to say again, thank you all for being here. Your engagement on this issue is critical. We need to make sure that we have uh, Congress's back and the president's back on doing something that will help with climate change, clean energy, jobs, justice. And that's why we're speaking with the congressman this evening. So let me just stop sharing my screen here with a last reminder. Um, technical problems, put them in the chat, that's fine. I think I have gone over everything else here. We do have some folks helping with tech on the back end. All right. So, Congressman, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who may not be as aware, um, Congressman Boyle was born and raised in the city of Philadelphia. The son of an immigrant, Congressman Boyle's father was a janitor for SEPTA, and his mother was a school crossing guard. He was the first to attend college in his family and attended Notre Dame, then graduated from Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government with a degree in public policy. Uh, Congressman Boyle was first elected to this Pennsylvania state legislature in 2008, becoming the first Democrat ever to represent that district. Two years later, his brother was also elected to the state legislature, making them the first brothers to serve together in the state house. In 2014, Congressman Boyle pulled off an upset win over three better funded rivals to be elected to Congress. He is now in his fourth term, representing the second congressional district of Philadelphia, which is entirely enclosed in the city. We have some districts that are outside in some neighboring counties as well as the city, but he is fully in the city of Philadelphia. Currently serves on the House Ways and Means Committee, the Select Revenue Subcommittee, and the Trade Subcommittee thereof. Also serves as the Vice Chair of the House Committee on the Budget, and he has previously served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Committee on Oversight and Government. Congressman Boyle is also the founder and co-chair of the Blue Collar Caucus, which advocates for working families by addressing wage, excuse me, wage stagnation, job insecurity, and the future of work. So thank you so much for joining us. Even more people came in while I read that bio. We really appreciate it. Congressman, welcome. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Katie, uh, for that very nice introduction. And I, I want to thank the six organizations. I won't name them all since you, you just did a few moments ago. But I want to thank uh, the six organizations that uh, are sponsoring this and have invited me on. And I was happy to uh, accept your, your invitation. Um, this is potentially a historic time. 
I think I can say it is already historic because of what we passed in the American Rescue Plan, but it is potentially even more historic if we get this done and over the finish line and pass the American Jobs Plan uh, or infrastructure broadly defined, which I think we'll talk a little bit later. Um, in my view, and this is speaking just at the moment about physical infrastructure, there is no way to do an infrastructure bill without simultaneously um, talking about and addressing our environmental and energy needs. You are talking about the same thing. Why would any, forget nation, forget even companies, why would any individual, any individual homeowner uh, deciding to address an infrastructure issue uh, at the very micro level say, geez, I wanna save money. I'm gonna make my house more energy efficient. What you are doing at that moment is yes, upgrading your infrastructure, but you're also promoting and uh, putting in energy efficiency and as a nice uh, ancillary benefit, improving uh, our carbon footprint. So imagine that simple example, one homeowner multiplied across an entire nation, not just residential, but also commercial, not just our homes and our businesses, which actually um, leak a lot, uh, frankly, but our schools, many of which in our city of Philadelphia were built close to, if not over a century ago. Uh, so this is what we're talking about. This is a, uh, a generational type investment to the tune of trillions of dollars. Um, it has long been talked about that we need an infrastructure bill. Um, I was not, and this is a nonpartisan um, uh, group, so I won't elaborate, but I was uh, not exactly a supporter of the previous administration. And yet, whenever I was asked on TV, typically after I just tweeted something perhaps you know not very uh, supportive of, of President Trump, I was typically asked, well, you know, is there any area where you guys can agree? I immediately would say infrastructure. In my, this was my view four plus years ago that there was a historic opportunity to go big and to be bold um, even reached out to the then uh, folks in the White House to talk about it and ways that we could do that. And, and I, it's a great regret that that wasn't, that wasn't achieved. Well, now here we are right on the precipice. Now, suppose, um, and it won't be this group, but suppose you were someone who uh, needed to be convinced on climate change, or you just really didn't care about the environment all that much. Let me address to you specifically, we need an infrastructure bill, even for reasons that go beyond the ticking time clock to address climate change. Uh, the American Council of Engineers, as well as the International Council of Engineers, rates the state of American infrastructure a D. Some years it gets a D minus. I didn't even know D minus could be, um, <laughs> actually could, was uh, such a grade. Either way, it's failing. Um, you know, I remember uh, very vividly about five years ago or so when 60 Minutes, and this was five years ago now, 60 Minutes wanted to do a, one of their long feature stories on the state of America's crumbling infrastructure. The state they came to was Pennsylvania, and they went to two places specifically, Pittsburgh to show all of the bridges. It turns out if you're going to build a city where three rivers intersect, you need a lot of bridges. Uh, but the other area they went to was Philadelphia, in fact, in my district. And they showed part of I-95 running through Northeast Philadelphia that literally was crumbling. No engineer caught it, no government official caught it. It was when part of the crumbling, because most of I-95 through Philadelphia actually is a bridge or a series of bridges, part of it started to fall literally on cars. So um, this is a national um, effort, no question about it. But I would argue that back home in the Keystone State in our own Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we stand to benefit more from this sort of a historic investment in our infrastructure than possibly any other state in the union. 
And that includes all of Pennsylvania's 67 counties. So I could go on, but why don't I pause there because I know we're gonna have a pretty substantive Q&A and I hope I'll be able to address the component parts and then finally talk about where you know exactly we are literally at this moment on June 23rd, uh, where we stand in, in the process um, because we still have a lot of work to do between now and when Congress adjourns for the August recess, we basically have five weeks in which to get this done. So we are really right now, I don't know, I'd say in the, the top of the eighth or maybe bottom of the eighth inning um, in one that we just have to win. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for those remarks. We'll dive into questions. Um, I think we're going to kick off with some more specifics right away. So why is the American Jobs Plan so important for your district? We have a lot of people from your district here. Are there certain kinds of benefits your constituents can expect if passed? Any projects specifically in Philadelphia that you think would be a priority? Yeah, so I, first, I'm glad to see we have people from, from all over uh, Pennsylvania, but we also have a lot from, from my district. I see at least one person that I know was in my old state house district. So um, you really have, have a great group. And so toward the end uh, of my statement, I attempted to bring it from the national to the very local. And yes, my district, uh, like the 434 other congressional districts, would specifically benefit um, of course, one of the challenges when we're talking about Washington, D.C., and we're talking about the federal government, it's always indirectly, right? Because, you know, I'm not mayor, I'm not uh, a city council person, so I'm not directing, yes, do this on the project, but providing the funding to go to them and to go to other nonprofit entities so they can do projects. So, for example, um, there would not be really we're talking about the bigger sort of infrastructure package that the president and many of us are pushing for and, and want, there wouldn't be one facet of my district that wouldn't be touched. We're talking about rail, both in terms of intercity, such as Amtrak, but also intra-region with SEPTA. You would have roads, bridges. I mentioned that, you know, when we think of bridges, we tend to think of the bridges in our area that connect Philadelphia with New Jersey. But actually, we have far more bridges than that. As I mentioned before, most of I-95 is a series of, of bridges. Um, one aspect that is currently in the bill that I have been fighting for for years is money to rehab older schools. Um, I toured the first uh, school that I went, I mostly went to parochial schools, but my first school that I went to was Lowell Elementary in Olney. This was right before the pandemic. The infrastructure needs of that very old building are immense. They obviously, imagine if the city of Philadelphia attempted on its own to fund the rehabbing and greater energy efficiency of all of their older buildings. They don't have the capacity to do that. The federal government can and can do that on a mass scale. Just imagine the sort of positive benefits that provides both Financially, these are investments that I'm talking about with a demonstrated return on investment. Anytime you do a capital project, that's the case. So financially, it makes sense, but then also in terms of making us ener more energy efficient, it helps uh, in terms of our, um, our, our environmental uh, impact. So really, you could, not, um, you could not really talk about any aspect of my congressional district that wouldn't benefit uh, from this big and bold plan. Oh. And a, a follow up to that is, are there some specific things um, beyond roads and bridges? One thing I know that um, conservation voters and other uh, sponsors on this call really care about is SEPTA, lines yeah. and service. Um, will there be a, a substantial investment that will really help SEPTA and, and push SEPTA to be more green? The short answer is yes. Um, you mentioned my, you know, my father worked for SEPTA for close to two decades. I uh, was a janitor mostly on the Broad Street line. So I care very deeply uh, about SEPTA. It's also, even if you don't use SEPTA, bear in mind that it is critical to our regional economy. Um, so even if you aren't using SEPTA, if you are someone who mostly commutes by driving, 
as, as much congestion as there might be on the roads already, imagine how much more there would be if we didn't have such a, a widespread mass transit system. So yes, as I mentioned before, there is funding for our transit systems. I also, I, I, I talked about the school aspect before, but one of the things that I'm really excited about in the American Jobs Plan is that it would produce, preserve, and retrofit more than 2 million housing units across the country. Now, many of those, or a certain percentage of those, would be in Philadelphia. Um, so I mentioned roads, bridges, rail. I forgot to mention, I think, our ports. The Port of Philadelphia, we have a couple of them, incredibly important. Um, in fact, now with the, the, the dredging complete in the Delaware River, there's the opportunity to fill it out for Philadelphia to be more competitive when it comes uh, to, to shipping. That's something, for, both in terms of the port infrastructure, but also um, a, a number of ways that we can ensure we're better balancing our commercial needs, but also our needs to get people back on the, the water and to enjoy that uh, for recreational use. It's done such a wonderful job on the Susque uh, Susquehanna, on the Schuylkill. Uh, I'm, I'm appealing to Central PA there by <laughs> saying Susquehanna. Um, but uh, on the Schuylkill, just think of the enormous strides that have been made over the last decade, 15 years, in terms of getting people uh, to use, use that more recreationally. I mean, you see kayaks. I know I've been out there myself on a, on a kayak. Now at Glen Ford on the Delaware River, they bring people out on, on kayaks. Americans are rediscovering how important these waterways are after really abandoning them for a good half century. So I, it's uh, one of the challenges about talking about a bill this big is that there are so many different components of it that each and every one of them, uh, if they were alone, would be um, an important standalone bill. But combined, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, transformative. Thank you. And I am in the middle of the state, so you can talk about the Susquehanna anytime. Um, the next question that we have is, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the jobs plan for the future growth and sustainability of well-paying union jobs? Um, it seems that there, you know, union labor is essential in the fight to reduce emissions and, and tackle climate change and help low-income communities. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the jobs plan would affect that? Yeah, sure. And by the way, I, I can't, uh, because I'm trying to cover so much, I can't remember if I mentioned, but specifically in the American Jobs Plan for transit, the number is 85 billion. Mm -hmm. So if you're wondering what that line item is, of course, that could change. Um, but at the moment, it stands at $85 billion. Now, uh, in terms of the union jobs, so you know, both my, my parents were lifelong, uh, or at least as for their working ages, members of, of labor unions, um, I think it is incredibly important that we grow the percentage of our workforce that's unionized. And there are two data points that I would uh, just point out to you in, in case um, you, know, you might not be aware or might be skeptical on this. From the late 1940s until the late 1970s, as the percentage of the American workforce in a union went up, so did the middle class, middle class a share of overall American wealth. So one, now in Zoom, this is gonna be hard because I'm pointing, there we go. I have to do it the opposite way. Um, so as the percentage of the American workforce in the union went up, you also saw a corresponding increase in the percentage of wealth that the middle class owns. Right around 1980, both of them stopped and started going the other way. And so we're now at a, an 80 year low, 90 year low in terms of the number of Americans who are in a labor union and the percentage of workers who are in a labor union. Guess what? According to Pew Charitable Trust, we have also seen the wealth owned by the middle class in this country decline. 80 years of economic evidence is not a coincidence. So it is incredibly important, even if you yourself are not in a labor union, which the overwhelming majority of Americans are not, but the fact that there is a labor union that exists, and if it's strong, their ability to negotiate for wages and benefits actually helps every other uh, worker in the private sector. So 
I'm very committed to making sure we grow the number of, of labor jobs. There are specific provisions in the bill. A lot of the kind of projects that we're talking about, if you think about it, that are already in industries that happen to be heavily unionized. So explicitly there are protections in there to grow the number of union jobs, but then even implicitly where we're directing the spending, um, you will see a benefit to that as well. I'd also just point out, aside from this specific uh, piece of legislation, I work very closely. I'm part of a, a blue-green group. Uh, for too long, those who oppose progress on the environment have been pretty shrewd and cynically attempting to divide the hardworking men and women of organized labor and people who are committed to addressing our generational existential crisis of climate change. And so I've been someone who's really attempting to bridge that divide because we absolutely need it. It's understandable if someone doesn't want to give up the family sustaining job that they have because they're afraid there might not be something on the other end to replace it. We need to do a better job of making sure there is that family sustaining job with protections that come in uh, addressing climate change. Thank you for that. And it's certainly something we're familiar with here in the state that we're actively yes. trying to work on with state stuff. So really appreciate that. Um, switching a little bit away from jobs, although still still related, how will the American Jobs Plan address years of environmental racism that really has resulted in disproportionate environmental impacts on communities of color in Philadelphia and throughout the state? Yeah, you know, I think this is a term that is often um, misunderstood because at first glance, someone might hear the term environmental racism and say, oh, well, how can the environment be racist? That's not what is meant. I, I know uh, you know this, but um, environmental racism is things like, geez, how in New Orleans did the Ninth Ward with the highest concentration of poor people end up getting placed in an area that was the most vulnerable to flooding? How come in other areas when you have a big polluter, they are allowed to basically be right next door to communities that are poor and typically more likely than not, not to be white? That's the kind of thing that we're talking about when, you know, when those of us are concerned about uh, environmental racism, or essentially the way, particularly poor people, but also um, poor people and, uh, you know, especially of color, have really been put at a disadvantage um, when it comes to then who suffers from the sort of uh, negative aspects of climate change. I mean, I, I'm someone who was born and raised in, in the city and uh, developed asthma. Um, it's well known that people who are in urban areas, especially very dense urban areas where there's a lack of um, a proper amount of green space are more susceptible. Uh, statistically, by the way, I point out, I use the Katrina example. It is true statistically, not just that one example. People of color nationally are far more likely to live in areas that are floodplains. They're far more air, uh, likely to be vulnerable to flooding as well as other climate change uh, related weather events. So making sure that in this bill, there are targeted investments specifically to address that, that's important. That is in the bill now. Uh, I, I know that that is an important matter, not just to the White House, but also a number of us who are part of the House Democratic uh, Caucus making sure that communities that are most vulnerable physically and financially, the climate disasters, when they build back, they're building above the existing codes and standards. That, that is, uh, in my view, critical, and I'm proud that that's in the bill. Thank you. Um, if we fail to make these investments now, if we fail to get this done, um, in, in 2021, what do you think the broader implications are for climate change, for our national economy? Um, simply put, why do we need the AJP now? 
Yeah. Well, first, if you hear a, an alarm going off, don't be alarmed. That's the the uh, old fashioned bell system the House of Representatives still has. So those bells going off were to notify uh, all of us who are around here that the, the House has just adjourned uh, session for the day. Um, so anyway, in, in case anyone was, was concerned, because I have had, uh, this is pre-pandemic, I've had people in my office um, suddenly jump when they hear the, uh, the bells go off. Uh, now, in, in terms of your great question, this is how I always answer that. We can either pay now or we can pay more later. And by pay more, yes, I mean that in terms of dollars, but I also mean paying more in many other ways than just dollars and cents. Um, this is the time. Frankly, 10 years ago was the time. We, we've already uh, missed the early part of the window. You know, when we talk about climate change, it's often presented as a binary, like it'll either happen or it won't happen. That's not the case. As we've seen, we're already experiencing climate change. We are too late to totally prevent that. Um, but if we are going to prevent the absolute most dire scenario, um, then we need to, to act now. So act now and pay or pay far more down the road. I would also point out um, just, and, and I've done this a little bit before, but in terms of our economy, you know, something that the president often says is that when he hears climate change, the word he think of is jobs. And when you're making this sort of a large scale investment, retrofitting schools and homes, rebuilding roads, improving ports. We haven't even gotten to water infrastructure yet. Literally uprooting every single lead pipe in America and finally fixing that problem. Man, that's a ton, that's a ton of jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in terms of a, a great effort to stimulate our economy, uh, you know, there, there's no greater um, economic stimulus we could do or pass than this bill. No. Um, along with that, um, we are starting to, to get some questions in here. We're compiling questions from people in the chat. We don't have all night uh, for the congressman to spend with us. We've been getting some great questions in. So I'm going to keep moving along and get to some of these participant questions in a little bit. The next question is, and this is related to a participant question, um, particularly uh, from uh, Hadley also asked something very similar to this question. Why is it so important that we also invest in things like care work and not just roads, bridges, and the other things that people usually think about when they hear the word infrastructure? Yeah, so this has become sort of like a, a game of semantics with um, sometimes some, as some folks have noticed in the media, well, does this technically count as infrastructure? Is that I am of the view that we need to have a broad definition of infrastructure, our physical infrastructure, but also our human infrastructure. I mean, we've just went through you know, the greatest economic disruption uh, and the greatest disruption to our lives in, in American history. Um, in many ways, that recession was nicknamed the she session because of the problem that we have of a lack of affordable childcare in the United States. If we don't address that, then we're not going to be able to reap the sort of full benefits that we're about to get uh, in terms of this great massive investment in our infrastructure that we're about to undertake. If we don't have and join the rest of the, um, the rest of the industrialized world in having true paid family leave, then we are not going to be able to reach our full potential. Now, some want to, you know, kind of obsess over whether or not that technically meets the definition of infrastructure or not. Again, I, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to Webster's dictionary. I just am more concerned, is it a good idea or not? Is it fair? Is it just? Will it benefit all of us to make that sort of um, investment? I think the answer is yes. I, and I think this is the time to do it. Uh, there have been very few times in my lifetime a policy window has opened to do big transformative things. I would argue this is the first time in a dozen years. The last time before that was maybe 15 years earlier, but not really. And then the last time before that was the 1960s. So this is arguably only the second time in my lifetime 
that there's an opportunity to really do these transformative things. I think the, um, the, the pandemic has really changed a number of Americans' views on the role of government and what it needs to do. And so in my view that this is the time to do it, the questioner is exactly right that when we think of infrastructure and we think of what we're about to undertake, um, we can't just focus on the physical, we need to focus on the human. Um, the next question, we're getting more into some participant or participant related questions. Some of you have had similar questions, so there's been a little combining. Um, Megan from the Northeast Times is asking if the American Jobs Plan will address things like stormwater runoff, particularly that would affect our friends at TTF Watershed. Yeah, well, certainly I, I love and do a lot of things with the TTF um, Watershed. Um, and it's a very good, important question, again, attempting to take something that is big at the national level and you know, really bring that home to, uh, to the more local level. Um, so there are a couple of things on this. Uh, in terms of our drinking water issues in the United States, which we have not just Flint, Michigan, but I know from when I used to represent part of Montgomery County, they have them in Horsham and Hatboro and the areas of Montgomery County and Bucks County that border around the Willow Grove base. They have them in similar areas in New Hampshire, other parts of Michigan, Colorado. We have them in Philadelphia as well and in, in not uh, related to PFO or PFOS, which were the contaminants in the Will Grove case, but we have our own situation with lead pipes. So uh, the reality is this is the, the time to, uh, to do it. Now, in terms of um, whether you call it Tuckany Creek, like I did growing up, or Tacony Creek, uh, and, and in terms of the watershed, overall in this plan, the American Jobs Plan, there is $111 billion, 111, $111 billion to cover all of the drinking water infrastructure improvements. Uh, so out of that pool of 111 billion, municipalities such as Philadelphia Water would have the opportunity to compete for those funds. Certainly I will use uh, all of my influence to, to ensure that, um, that we get you know, at least our, our fair share. The stormwater management uh, would come in under that as well. I, I also do, you know, since it's a very uh, local question actually to Northeast Philly where I live, um, separate from the American Jobs Plan, for the first time in more than 10 years, Congress allowed members to pick certain priorities as part of the, the bill that just passed the House Transportation Committee. And literally one of the, you know, you only got to pick between three and five. Fortunately, all the five I picked uh, got in. Um, so this is called member-directed funding. Some call it earmarks. Again, I don't care about the semantics. I just want the money to come back home. Um, this funding would support the design and construction of the next phase of the Frankfurt Creek Greenway. Uh, it's really exciting. It would basically go from the Adams Avenue connector to the Bristol Street Park using a combination of streets and parkland. Upon completion, the project will connect the Frankfurt neighborhood with the East Coast Greenway along the Delaware River as two neighborhood parks um, presently under development by, by Philly Parks and Rec get constructed. You know, one of the, the, the frustrations I have is that there aren't enough points for public access to the Delaware River. We've done, you know, thanks to TTF, um, as well as Riverfront North and some other uh, projects, we're a lot further along now than where we were, say, 10 years ago. But we still need to do a better job of, of, uh, on these greenways. So I'm glad that that project is in the bill. And uh, as long as the Senate doesn't uh, mess this up, uh, that will survive. And so that actually is money that, that I was able to get and specifically uh, appropriate um, for right back home. Yeah, thank you. That actually kind of leads a little bit into um, our next question from Naomi. Um, and I believe uh, Molly also had a similar um, question about it. We know that Senator Casey has been actively advocating for a civilian climate core, and that type of program was mentioned in the original Biden proposal as well. Um, 
do you think AJP will will pull through and fund something like that, which could not only educate people about nature, but also provide some entry level, good paying jobs? Yes, I, I, so actually I was just talking about this at lunchtime with Senator Coons uh, from our area, from, from right next door in Delaware. I'm a strong supporter of it. I, I'm very excited about it. I do believe that that will be in the bill. It is a very cost effective way, by the way, to help people, whether it's you know planting tr trees to help uh, regrow our forests where that is needed to uh, you know support green projects in urban areas, and by doing that, you can also help young people uh, be able to afford college. I, I I'm a big big fan of it, strong supporter of it. I think it has pretty broad support, uh, and so my prediction is that it will survive. That that will be as long as we get a bill passed. I do think the uh, CCC will be in it. That is great news, I think, for a lot of people on this call. Um, we're very, we, we hope so. Um, I'm, what I'm actually gonna do is, um, Julie and Elise had also asked some questions related to our final question here, because we only have a couple more minutes of the congressman's time. Um, you had said earlier that you would be happy to explain the process. Um, as you do so, especially with your role on ways and means and how that will interact with things, what can we do to also help get this passed? What can these wonderful people listening to this right now do? And is there anything that you consider non-negotiable as you are working through this process? Uh, yeah, so a lot of good questions uh, in there. First, so I, I serve on the Ways and Means Committee. Actually, you're not able to see, but right across uh, the hall is, is the House uh, Ways and Means Committee room. Um, it was also the room, by it's the largest room uh, in the House. And, and so uh, a number of historic uh, hearings have taken place uh, in it. So you, you probably recognize the room from TV. It is the oldest committee in Congress. It is the tax writing committee. So any and all of the tax changes to help pay for this would have to go through our committee. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk uh, about any of them, but um, they're pretty significant. Now that leads into uh, the, uh, the next question, and that is, where are we in the process? Um, so the House is essentially waiting at the moment on our uh, friends and colleagues in the Senate to figure out uh, which path they want to go, whether or not they want to do one bill or two bills. The latest thought as of like a few hours ago is that if it can be achieved, there would be two bills, one just on let's call physical infrastructure to the tune of about $1.2 trillion. This would be a bipartisan uh, bill with at least 11 Republicans supporting it. Uh, it would not fund any of the human infrastructure things we talked about, but there would be a second bill that would strictly be voted for, you know, frankly, by Democrats that would fund some of the things we talked about, like paid family leave, childcare, et cetera. Um, you would have two different sort of coalitions passing both of those of the Senate. In the House, um, I know there would be a number of us who support both, but want to make sure that one doesn't, that one doesn't end up in the finish line and the other suddenly gets left short. So I would strongly suspect that the House would hold up uh, the bills until both had passed in the Senate. So that way they could, could both move forward. Um, however, that's really all subject to change. And, and when I say subject to change, I mean, I, I do think over the next couple of days, it's sort of fish or cut bait in terms of, um, that, that idea. And then option two would be just go into one bill, which, which, you know, I've always thought was more likely from the beginning, candidly, but go to one bill that would be using the reconciliation process. I'll spare all of you the mind numbing um, details on reconciliation. I'm glad I serve in the house where we don't have to uh, worry about that. And like every other legislative body in the Western world, we you know, pass things um, uh, by simple majority. Um, but of course we do have to keep it in the back of our mind because we know what the Senate rules are. So 
Uh, so that is where we are. And then finally, how you can make a difference. Man, get on the phones, work the phones. If you're comfortable even showing up to uh, if, if offices are back open uh, for the people who need to be persuaded. You know, um, I, I, I think that this is really, I think it is likely to have, well, I would say it's more likely than not to happen, but boy, um, for five weeks, there's still a lot of details that, that have to be worked out in a short period of time. So as I mentioned, I think we're in the eighth inning of this, we're really coming up to crunch time. So if you care about this, which obviously you do, this is the time to be heard. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Congressman Boyle. Um, we know that you are going to have to have to leave us here in a little bit. You are, of course, welcome to stay on. We've got a couple more things for all of our guests here, but I just a big thank you and thank you for being willing to to stand up for the American Jobs Plan and fighting for it and clean energy and justice and jobs. It really means a lot to conservation voters and our partners and volunteers on this call as well that we do something to address these issues. So thank you so thank much, you. Congressman. Um, thank you. Thank you, Katie. I'll, I'll just say thank you to all of you uh, for your passion and your knowledge on these issues. This is, uh, this is an exciting time to be a, a, a difficult time, but an exciting time to be a member of Congress. I feel like I already voted for something truly historic in the American Rescue Plan. All those families that are about to get the child tax credit in the next few weeks, um, you know, that, that is the product of, of our work. This right here, I feel very passionately that, uh, feel passionately that this needs to be get, get done and it needs to be as big and bold as possible because this opportunity will not come again if we waste it. Um, I know I, I look young and I am, uh, I, I suppose, uh, uh, young compared to some of my colleagues, but I've been elective office for 12 years and I follow politics for a long time. This is a window that rarely opens and we need to take advantage of it now. Thank you so much, Congressman. We really appreciate it and appreciate the passion. Thank you. Folks, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I am actually going to kick this over to my colleague, Kai Mateo. Thank you so much, Katie. And uh, thank you again to Congressman Boyle for really engaging an important conversation on the American Jobs Plan. And as the Congressman said, thank you to each and every one of you for being here tonight. And as the Congressman said, we're in the eighth inning of this fight. Um, the crunch time is now, and it's going to be critically, critically important that amazing volunteers like all of you um, get involved and help us get this thing across the finish line. And in addition to the things that Congressman mentioned of calling your representatives, showing up to their offices if you're comfortable, um, the conservation voters of Pennsylvania and our partners are working to collect stories from people like you that will help us get this bill across the finish line. So if you care, about getting green jobs in your community, we wanna hear your story. If you care about environmental justice and making sure that the American Jobs Plan uh, remedies longstanding injustices that have put low-income communities and communities of color on the front lines of pollution and climate change, we want to hear your story. If you care about union jobs, if you care about the care economy that the Congressman spoke so eloquently about, we wanna hear from you. In the chat and on the screen, there's that link, the bit.ly with those letters and numbers after that. Click on that link, open that tab on your internet browser, and you'll be able to fill out a couple of questions, your name, your neighborhood, and then you'll be able to record a video and actually share your story. Tell us why you care. This will help us win the battle for hearts and minds. This will help us convince members of Congress. This will help us convince other volunteers like you to join us in the fight. This is something that volunteers from across the country are joining us in, and we want to hear from all of you. Um, so my ask of you is if you want to take the next step in helping move this campaign forward, can you raise your hand if you want to help pass the American Jobs Plan? Just raise your hand. It's like Laura's raising her hand, Jean is raising her hand, I see Eddie, I see John, Steve. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to take that hand, 
bring it down to your keyboard or your mouse, click on this link and get ready to record your story. As soon as the Zoom call ends, you'll record that story. Um, we'll take it, uh, follow up with you and make it part of our campaign to pass the American Jobs Plan. Thank you all so, so much. Really looking forward to hearing your stories. And with that, I would like to introduce um, Alex Kupo from the Sustainable Business Network, um, one of our amazing partners for this event and a partner in the fight for the American Jobs Plan, uh, who's going to say a few remarks. Alex? Thank you so much, Kai, and thank you so much to Congressman Boyle for uh, speaking with us this evening and answering our questions. And I'd also like to thank our partners for bringing us all together to a just, green, and thriving economy. We empower the region's diverse, independent businesses to do well by doing good. We advance industries critical to a vibrant, local, equitable, and climate resilient economy, and we advocate for an economic ecosystem that centers localism, serves community needs, shares wealth, and protects our environment. As we rebuild from the economic impacts of the pandemic and address longstanding inequities and the need for climate action, we must expand pr gro proven growth industries that create opportunities for diverse small businesses, provide family supporting wages, support equitable community development and public health, and advance climate resilience. For SBN, GSI, renewable energy, are three such industries. Partnership for businesses and leaders in the green structures with the help of Fourth Economy titled GSI, a tool for economic growth and recovery in Pennsylvania. The report, which can be found at the link in the chat, makes the case for increasing funding for GSI as a tool for creating jobs with family supporting wages, investment in our communities, and building a strong and diverse work workforce. And I'm going to share my screen so you can see a little bit of that report right now. So some of the years across Pennsylvania, which is more than the number of middle school teachers in the state, the number of jobs of Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania's GSI industry is growing faster than the Commonwealth's overall job growth. From 2011 until 2019, jobs in the state's GSI industry grew at 9.2% compared to Pennsylvania's 6.3%. And in Philadelphia, those numbers are even stronger. The GSI industry provides family supporting jobs and accessible opportunities for career advancement for people of all education and work experience levels. One of two GSI workers earn at least $15 an hour, even without a high school diploma or equivalent. Additionally, several of the sectors in the GSI industry are known for being accessible to returning citizens. The GSI industry and the it seems that Alex is breaking up a little bit here. Workforce. Alex, are you with us? Did we lose Alex? You heard? We Not may. <laughs> are you back? Are you there, Alex? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, can you still see the screen? Yes. Okay, <laughs> Okay. there's always one of us. There's always one of us during a, a Zoom webinar that, that has a weak connection, I apologize. Um, I'll just say that these numbers speak for themselves and that the stats support our calls for increasing our investment in green storm water infrastructure, providing resilient jobs and infrastructure for the Commonwealth. We hope that you'll be able to take the time to review the report and you can send any questions that you have to me at alex at sbnphiladelphia.org. Thank you for your time and I'll turn it back over to Katie. Sorry again for the uh, technical difficulties there. That is okay. Um, we still have them a, a year and a half into Zoom events and the pandemic. Um, but again, please check out the link that was put in the chat about SBN's GSI report and also um, the link a little bit further up in the chat about telling your story. It's really important that we communicate um, to our elected officials why this is so, so important. 
Um, we are coming very close to time right now. Um, so I do want to thank our sponsors again. So again, on behalf of conservation voters, thank you all very much for attending, but also thank you to Penn Future, uh, Penn Environment, um, TTF Watershed, um, Audubon Mid-Atlantic, Clean Water Action, and the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia. We are so grateful that all of you could take about an hour out of your time tonight. We're really excited that so many people raised their hands this evening. Please tell your story. Please check out these reports. Please pay attention to um, our emails as well as the email alerts from all of our partners. There is a lot of work going on to make sure that this is a this stays, and I'm going to keep saying it, a big, bold plan. Um, I'm even going to use some alliteration and say we can build back better with a big, bold plan, according to Brendan Boyle. So um let's get this done let's uh continue to connect with each other and our organizations and our elected leaders to make sure that we can have clean energy combat climate change address justice and equity and make sure that people in any part of the economy have a good paying job so thank you all so much for attending tonight and we look forward to being in touch with you as we work on getting this done <laughs>